Would you agree with me that if you look at something that has structure like my mobile phone, that that would have to have a mind and a design? No. So this can come about by random chance, can it? It could. It could. Okay, so there you go. This is, this is a faith position. You have faith just like I have faith. I don't think it would be a bad thing to request that I be a witness to his majestic power for me to, to follow and believe. Mm. Everybody else in the Bible seems to be getting evidence, whether it's the disciples or people who aren't even the disciples. Mm. They witness what Jesus does. Yeah. And we are here following this belief system, but we haven't witnessed anything. There's a certain point if your disbelief falls into the black hole mm -hmm. of reductionist materialism, that no amount of miracles can ever convince you. Christ himself said this. decided to walk on Lake Galilee, right, beautiful yeah, yeah. lake. I've been yeah. like, the disciples didn't go, did you see that? No, no. That's what I want. Or when yeah, Moses came see, into the, the uh, Pharaoh's yeah. palace, yeah. pulled out to his god, put his rod down, yeah. turned into a snake. Everybody in the palace saw it and they witnessed the power of his god. Yeah. So to me, it's hard when I'm following a belief system from a god and you can simply ask me a basic question. Have you seen that god? Have you felt that god? Have you touched that god or felt that god's presence? No. So then how can you be following the god? Well, let me, let me, let me try and address that point. I, I would... I would suggest to you that, firstly, what I find that leads most Christians away, when you start to dig into it, is actually that the church was not meeting their needs. The church wasn't dealing with the issues that they were dealing with, and when it was dealing with them, it was not necessarily dealing with them in any effective way. And this often actually drives more of our decision making, and then the rationales come later, you know? The rationale as to why we might have changed our course in life come after the event of changing our course in life and actually part of the reason why so many people have left the church is because the church is so bad at actually addressing the real questions in real people's lives and addressing them as a community you know but to, to deal with the rationale this idea of well I need to see God to believe in God we know all the characters that I was reading about yeah they all witnessed and yeah. I'm not even talking about prophets I'm yeah. talking about ordinary lay people. Like yeah. I gave the example of the, the Israelites witnessing the Red Sea split. Yeah. Or, or the, the people in the Pharaoh's palace and watching Moses turn his stuff into a rod. I saw yeah. his rod into a snake. And watching the Pharaoh's magicians use their gods, turn theirs into a snake. But Moses triumph. Yeah. So you had people there, witnesses. I'm just simply saying, I don't think it would be a bad thing to request that I be a witness to his majestic power for me mm. to to follow and believe. Mm. Everybody else in the Bible seems to be getting evidence, whether it's the disciples or people who aren't even the disciples. Mm. They witness what Jesus does. Yeah. And we are here following this belief system, but we haven't witnessed anything. Well, actually, actually, I mean, firstly, the, the, the church is replete with the testimony of miracles. It, it is replete with the testimony of miracles. Are we talking really... Catholic Church? We're, we're talking about the, the, the global church is right. replete with the, the testimony of miracles. But if you come from a reductionist, materialistic narrative, it doesn't matter how many miracles you're presented with, you will always seek to explain them away. You know, if you, you ask some of the most ardent atheists, if they actually saw God in the sky speaking to them, would they come to faith or would they assume they're having a nervous breakdown? Is it, is it <laughs> they, more intelligent they, they to look would, for the cause? We, well, uh, let, me, let me come to that. They, they, would, they, would, they would come to the conclusion that they're having some kind of nervous breakdown. There's a certain point, if your disbelief falls into the black hole of reductionist materialism, that no amount of miracles can ever convince you. Christ himself said this. He said, you know, the parable of Lazarus? You know, the idea of the, the, the Lazarus, the poor man at the rich man's gate who had sores that the dogs came to lick. The rich man died and he was cast into hell and Lazarus went to heaven and rested into the bosom of Abraham. The, 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 the poor man, sorry, Lazarus called out to um, Lazarus and said, you know, I'm burning here, give me just a, a drop of, to, to quench my thirst. And he said, no, there's a chasm between us. And then he said, well, at least send messengers back to my brothers so that they don't fall under the same fate. And, and Lazarus, Lazarus, it was replied that they have Moses and the prophets. And if they don't believe these, even if a man rises from the dead, they still won't believe. There is a degree of disbelief beyond which you can't escape. 
I'm, I'm you glad know? to ask you a question. Well, let me just let me just address this guy's point and this guy's point, and then you, if you want to jump in with a question, if that's all right. So okay. the the point that no, the this point is what the religious the, do. They the, take a long lecture. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So I'm, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking to you anyway. Right, let question. them have their own conversation. Right, so my 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 point to you is that. There's a what kind of reductionist materialism like religion that prevents you what is a woman from, from seeing the miracles religion. and the wonders all around you. You can women. see the majestic glory of God. You can experience that majestic glory of God. But you have to take off that veil that prevents you from seeing it. Let me give you an example. And this, and this turns into what this brother was asking about. I'm, now, I'm going to address your point now. So he said, look for the cause. Now, if I got a dice, and I want, I want everyone who's listening to, to consider this. If I got a dice, right, I, I'll give you the way to make me an atheist right now. If you can get a dice and roll 76s in a row, I will renounce Christ, I'll renounce God, and I'll become an atheist. Now, do you, any of you want to take my bet that you can roll 76s in a row? No, of course you're not, because you know that's a fool's gamble, because you're smarter than that. But let me just, let, when you actually study astronomy and physics... No, no, I didn't, yeah. I didn't even make much of a point. Yeah, like if, I haven't really you, said anything. If you, what are you doing? If you, okay, okay, so, if you study, oh, if you study this is kind of astronomy and physics, this kind of what you Why find you is there are cosmological <laughs> forces that have to be in such fine balance with one another that the chances that this could happen by pure so random it's chance nice. <laughs> is statistically impossible. No, we've been it's like it rolling 76s with a dice in a row. Like, if you look at the, the balance of the Higgs boson with the balance of magnetic force, the balance of gravitational force, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the, 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 the and various other forces and energies that permit not only a material cosmology, but also intelligent life. The idea that the sun has to be just such a distance from the earth, that actually our moon has to be such a distance from the earth, and that all these things should happen just by chance. Statistically, it's impossible. It's laughable. It's like saying I can roll. It's 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 like saying I can roll seventy sixes in a row. Or it could be that yeah. the reason we exist is because it's like that. And if it was different, we wouldn't be here. Except that except the very fact that we can the, the very statistics. So can you roll seventy sixes in a row on a dice? Do you think you can? Oh, it's possible. Statistically, anything is possible. Right. But do you want to take my bet? I don't want to make any bets, I'm not a gambling man. Right, but do you see what I'm saying? No, sure. Yeah, but you are saying. a gambling man because what you're saying is that everything has come about by chance. I'm saying it, it that all, could be. all the deep ruptures, all. Well, I'm saying that it is more probable that it's not. Okay. Because of all the deep structures that we see within the cosmos, mm. it defies the possibility that it came by chance. I don't think it is. Yeah, okay. So, I mean. Again, it's back to the analogy of 76s in a row. That's your argument. You're saying basically the universe came about by a pure random chance. I haven't actually made, I haven't actually but said you, my well, opinion. So, oh, well, you said you don't think it is. So what do you think it is? Oh, okay. Well, it's that, I mean, I'm not closed to the, to the idea of higher beings at all. Um, I just look at the world of what I can see and what we can measure. And I take that to be as it is. And I'm not closing out that there's things that we can't detect or perceive because there most likely are, because I can't claim to have global knowledge. You know what I mean? Yep. As totally. science as science progresses, it gets deeper and deeper, and you find more wondrous things. Yeah, absolutely. So I can't make a blanket statement of it's not possible at all. Although I would say there's evidence for science, but I have not seen any evidence that con convinces me of, um, let's say, a religious perspective. Would you agree with me that if you look at something that has structure like my mobile phone? that that would have to have a mind of the design. No. So this can come about by random chance, can it? It could. It could. Okay, so there you go. This is, this is a faith position. You have faith just like I have faith. Your faith is in random chance. 
you think that randomly and pure coincidentally it is possible that all the atoms could be arranged to produce that. But how can we say that it, how could you say that it wouldn't be? Statistically, statistically, it's possible. Mm. But right. there becomes a point where statistically something is so incredulous right. that to believe it just because it's possible becomes a kind of stupidity. Oh, well, I would say it becomes a kind of honesty. It, it, it becomes a kind of grasping at straws because of a, 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 a wish not to believe in a creator. No, you, 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 that's not my view. You do believe in a creator? No, no, I don't have a wish not to. I have a wish to understand. I, I think that people, people, yeah, not, not my people who are willing to believe that atoms can spontaneously arrange themselves into mobile phones as a way of trying to argue that the universe can spontaneously arrange itself in such a way as to provide a life-giving universe or people grasping at straws because they don't want to face the obvious, which is that there is deep structure in the universe and structure implies a mind behind it. Only from our perspective? Absolutely. What because other perspective we, do we have? Exactly. Exactly. No, but that's it. I, I mean, I don't want to argue with you. Like, well, we are. I, I, no, <laughs> you, you don't like. You don't really know my full perspective. It take too long and be too boring to, to understand. I mean, for me to articulate it. But um, for me, like I said, it's just to pursue to pursue knowledge to try and find things out. I'm not ruling out creator at all. It could be. I'm just saying I don't have evidence of it. I mean, saying that everything is so unlikely. For me, it doesn't but, but, so, say so, so, I mean, you say, you say and, and this comes back to what you were saying, you say that we have to have something tangible to believe in, uh, an evidence-based system, right? It would help. Right, okay. So can either of you demonstrate to me when this principle was proven to you, what evidence was used to prove it to you, and who proved it to you? Which? Which principle? The principle of evidence. Well, yeah. That you need evidence before you can believe. Well, I, I gave you my examples which were from the scriptures. No, no, no. My, my question, the, 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 the mantra that we need evidence before we can believe in God. Oh, we don't. We don't. I, I'll, I'll accept that. I agree. We don't need that. We don't need that. I don't, I don't believe that anyone should need that. But I'm just saying, when I read the scriptures and I see all these people who follow these prophets, yep. they were given evidence and I don't think it's Actually, insulting for me to ask for evidence. I, I, but except that I would critique your understanding of the narrative of the scripture because the scripture, the scripture, the miracles were there to demonstrate the truth of the teaching that is the, the, there, certainly in, in, in Christ's and the apostles' teaching. But people believe in the Messiah for all kinds of reasons. So let, let, let's look at, look at some of the examples, the prophecies that point towards Christ. The idea that he was born in Bethlehem, the idea that he was born of a virgin, the idea that he was uh, that he would be in the house of David, the idea that he would uh, be crucified. Um, all of these things are witness to hundreds of years before they occur. What is the likelihood that so many prophecies about someone can be fulfilled by one person that you would get crucified yes it's a prophecy it was a common method of killing people then was it not it was indeed and so not too unlikely if you provoke the the powers of the state to get killed that way and what happens if the prophecy comes before the uh, implement the, before the development of crucifixion then it would be good imag bad imagination but your interpretation of the no, no hold on notice his narrative his narrative is that there can be nothing miraculous so anything that points to the miraculous has to be dismissed as coincidental or, or some other kind of characterization it's usually the most logical explanation I actually find atheists don't work by logic they work by faith but he's not an atheist because he's still willing to believe I don't from, think he is actually I, I, from, from, from what you said you, you said you said it was actually much more complicated it wasn't a case that you didn't believe you said it could be possible. Yeah, I just, I just so, don't so, have evidence so of it right now. So technically speaking, you're not actually an atheist. Because, because I, can't, I can't say in good faith that I know that there's not. It's not possible. So there might be. It's on you. Yeah, That's my and, and what I'm saying to you, and what, so it's an agnostic position. Well, most likely. Yeah, it is an agnostic position. The, 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 the position of agnosticism practically works out as atheism, but fair enough. You, 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 really? Why? It works pragmatically, doesn't it? Can you explain why? Because you're not living your life with God in, in it. You're, you're well, living your life ambivalent to God in much the same way that I mean don't get me wrong bro oh, you're just reflecting what all of us have been 
inculcated into in our agnostic society. The state practices state agnosticism. Lo and behold, it raises agnostics as its children. You don't know my background. That's, well, a, that's a massive jump. Maybe I came from a really religious upbringing. You don't know that. You're talking, either way, bro, your, your, your narrative that you're stating here reflects what state policy is. You're not, you're not saying anything unique just, or special. Yeah, I'm not saying I am. Uh, but, but so so the, the point is claiming to some you don't know my background. The fact is what you're saying to me right now is reflective of what the state tells me. Okay, well, it's got a coincidence. state education. You've got a lot of coincidences, bro. So let's look at a coincidence. It's a bit ironic. Let's look at coincidence. So uh, Psalm 22, yeah was written at a time before crucifixion okay listen listen to these words okay it's quite a long passage so i apologize yeah my god my god why have you forsaken me far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning oh my god i cry by day but you do not answer and by night but i have no rest yet you are holy O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. If you were trusted, if they, sorry, in you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him, let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my father's breast, upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Basham have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me, and as ravening and as roaring lions, I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil doers, evil doers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones, they look, they stare at me, they divide my garments amongst them, for my clothing they cast lots. Now you used to be a Christian, so you know the passion narrative, right? What happened? Okay, I mean, it might have been a long time, so let's just go over some of the passion narrative. The passion narrative in the Gospels was that Christ was falsely accused of firstly blaspheming against God, but because that wasn't a punishable, uh, executable punishment under Roman law, he was accused of being a traitor to Caesar and being a, a, a opposer of Caesar. So this led to his execution on false charges. At his crucifixion, in which they pierced his hands and his feet, they nailed him to a cross, in which, I don't know if any of you know the process of crucifixion, it's quite horrific. You don't die through blood loss, you die through asphyxiation. You suffocate because pressure is placed upon your pancreas I think it's the pancreas, diaphragm. no, diaphragm, thank you, my apologies. Your diaphragm, and it's your diaphragm that allows you to breathe. So someone who's being crucified constantly has to pull themselves up so they can breathe. But as you might well imagine, you can't keep doing that, so eventually you go back down, and so you're, you're, you're being stretched out, your body is being stretched. Christ suffered this punishment, and because of the heavy breathing, you start to suffer dryness. You start to suffer dry mouth. You become thirsty because your respiratory system is constantly being attacked. And this is the description that we're seeing here. A man whose hands and feet are being pierced, who is suffering from dry tongue, dry mouth. His joints are being pulled out because as you push yourself up and pull yourself up, you're exerting pressure on your joints, your elbows, your arms. Your rib cage is being exposed because you're stretching your skin across your body as you hang down. 
And also at Christ's crucifixion, the Roman soldiers, because they didn't want to tear Christ's robe, they gambled lots over his robe. They drew lots over who could have it. Now this psalm was written before crucifixion was ever invented and it was written before Christ's crucifixion. That psalm. That psalm. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now can you, atheist, can you, agnostic, explain to me... Well, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, wait first. I have a question for you. Can you explain to me, because when Christ was being crucified, he said, Eloi, Eloi, Sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which are the first line of this psalm. So Christ referred everyone back to this psalm at his own crucifixion. So can you explain to me how crucifixion is described before crucifixion occurs and how the events of Christ's crucifixion, the wagging of tongues, the jeering of him, the gambling over his garment, are prophesied before his crucifixion? Was it written after the fact? Don't answer a question with a question, I'm asking you a question. I don't do it like that. Um, I don't obviously don't have as much knowledge as you do about it, so I have to ask questions. Okay, simple as that. So I'll tell you again. This psalm was written hundreds of years before Christ, and it was written hundreds of years before the crucifixion the was invented. That's the bit I don't understand. Like, I, I'm genuinely asking. Like, I actually just want to know. Uh, what, what? Like, so you're saying this psalm, it was written before all this happened? Yes. By who? Why? By, by the, the psalmists in David's court. But they were making prophecies about somebody that wasn't No, in their or... minds they were they were putting together canticles in praise of God. Right. But as Christians we believe before Jesus was there. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, as Christians we believe that the Holy Spirit infused the words of men with divine revelation. And so that there are many passages in the Old Testament that point forward to the Messiah. Now every Jew will agree with me that the Old Testament points towards a coming Messiah. But why no don't, Jew will why disagree. Don't with the, that. the people you've just mentioned, the Jews, why don't they accept that then? And uh, only when to they Jesus. Were well, before we move on to a separate question, I'd like both of you to deal with the question I'm now posing to you. Well, my, my question goes is basically the same line as his. You said that it was written before so this happened to Jesus, and my question was going to be. Well, who wrote it and how do we know it's Which I've answered. Yeah. Well, you didn't give a name, you just said it was... It was, the, it was the psalmist in... in they're, not, they're not named. The, the psalmist in David's court wrote psalms commissioned by the King David. So, my question again to you is, we have an explanation of crucifixion before the punishment of crucifixion is invented and before the crucifixion of Messiah, Jesus, and the Messiah, Jesus, was crucified in such a way that matches the details of the psalm. But they were also so I would people, ask you yeah, first, my question to you, how? I don't know. Coincidence? No, but notice I said I don't know. That's fine. Which is intellectual honesty. Okay, so are you going back to your argument from coincidence? Well, it could be. You can make a prophecy and it comes true. Okay. It's not it, It's not so precise. I mean, I, was it really the first instance of crucifixion? Because no, of course it was Humans, humans are right. Okay. But I thought you were saying it was. Like no, 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 I never said that. I said, no, I didn't. You, you weren't listening. I said that the, the, well, the psalm... The so yes, we do. The psalm predates the invention of crucifixion. That's and I'm, obviously that's it predates Christ. And Christ's crucifixion, if you read the Passion narratives, yeah, <coughs> they cast lots over his garments. They swagger the tongue at him. They mock him while he's on the cross. They say to him, let Yahweh save him. Let him save himself. But that's what you would say. Yeah, that's if somebody's proclaiming them to be the Son of God exactly. and you're killing them, and you're so like, well, save you now, bro. So we have a narrative that's written centuries before an event that matches an event that we, in the Passion narratives, believe in. And the question for agnostics is how? Does someone hundreds of years before crucifixion is even invented describe the crucifixion with with details of such a character that they match an individual that we know to be Jesus of Nazareth? What were the descriptions of this character? The character of the crucifixion is. Oh, I mean, um, the way that he was killed. Right. So, so I, I will, I will read it to you. Yeah. 
To you they cry, sorry. Let, let, Right, but I am a, a, a worm, not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip, they wag their head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver you, let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Another example is where it says, They took, sorry. I can count all my bones, they loop, they stare at me, which is in the Passion Narrative. I think we'll find it in John's Passion Narrative. If, if that Psalm 22, I'm not going to say your line, I don't have enough knowledge to even question you. From what you're saying, if that Psalm 22, as you stated, was done hundreds of years, yes. then that looks like a prophecy. It is. It is a prophecy. Yes. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't condemn it or say it's a lie. Now, in terms of the evidence that you seek, would you agree with me that foreknowledge implies some higher source of knowledge. That if I can tell you what's going to happen in the future before it happens, yeah, that that gives that that, that implies that I have some access to foresight that we do not normally observe in nature. Would that constitute a miracle? Okay, say you say this is very great. It would constitute a miracle. Okay. So now let's look at the crucifixion narrative, okay? So I'm going to read from the Passion Narrative of John. Yeah, we'll, we can go through all the narratives of all the Gospels and we'll see. Yeah. Okay. 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 So. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place they called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus, Nazare Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts. They divided his garments between them, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they divided my outer garments amongst them, and for my clothing they casted lots. Is that, would that not be a common practice though? You know what I mean? If you've yeah. got a condemned man, he has possessions, you divide them between the people that are going to take them. It doesn't seem so much of a stretch. I think, you know. I think in terms of Christ fulfilling this prophecy of crucifixion, You've got to see that there are other prophecies that point to Christ's special nature. The Old Testament points about a particular figure, a Messiah figure, who will come from heaven and will establish God's throne on earth. That he will establish and reign in amongst his enemies. That he will establish a new kingdom, a new way of living, a new covenant. Christ did all of these things. When you say establish like the kingdom, yes. How, what does that mean? Did it happen? I mean, I don't understand exactly what that means. Yeah. So to it's a it's a fair question. To establish the kingdom, what Christ was doing was to establish the rule of God in the hearts and minds of those who would be saved. So we as Christians try to live a life of honor in, in worship to God as part of a living sacrifice, yeah, in which we allow God's rule in our heart, our mind, our soul, and our being. Yeah? And, and through that, we seek to establish God's kingdom here on earth. So we try to influence the politics. We we try to influence the economy. We try to influence social custom and decorum. Can I ask, what would that mean? You, you would want you want to change all these things to be more in line with what Jesus was saying. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah. Totally. And, and what means do you take to achieve that? 
So in terms of, in, oh, we're getting slightly off the point. So I, I want to stick. I want to stay to the point. But I, I will address that question, and I'm going to veer it sharply back to what we were talking about, which is that in terms of those means, we as Christians are caught. Say, it says in Scripture, Christ said that the men of violence make a way for the kingdom of God or they make a way for the kingdom and what that means is as Christians we are to pursue the kingdom of God and push aside everything that opposes the rule of the kingdom okay now that means that if in this democratic society we have democratic means to establish the kingdom of God we should follow them right if as in ISIS society when ISIS took over Iraq uh, and, and Syria part of Iraq and Syria, there isn't no way you can negotiate with the lunatics of ISIS. You've got to topple them first. Yeah? So for us, all means are open. But it depends, but we should always seek the good. So we should always seek that which is good. That's, that's an interesting one there. And when you say all means are open, um, obviously my knowledge of Christianity is very, very small. But it depends on the context. When, when, well, I, yeah, fair enough. All right. Well, that, depends that, that on the takes away from one thing that I used to think about. I used to think that it was a, a doctrine of um, of non-violence, but it's not. Yeah, Christianity doesn't teach pacifism. I wasn't. Well, I think there's a difference between the two. But what this is quite interesting what you said. If that's the case so you can you can institute the kingdom of God through violence. It's very difficult. It depends incredibly upon the context. Remember the example that I gave. But why would you situation let me let me be clear. Situations have to be of, of such an extreme nature that, that violence can ever be justified. It, it is only in extreme situations that in the Christian worldview, violence becomes justified. Because as Christians, we're called to be peacemakers. As Christians, we're called to love everyone. Which means that in a democratic society like the UK, yeah, pursuing the kingdom of God, well, there's no reason to use violence. Right. But in an ISIS situation, in an ISIS situation where to pursue the kingdom of God, God means oppression and death. That that situation that you've got to topple that government. Okay, but my next my next logical question is why would you have to attack them? That's what I mean. Is it a doctrine that requires it to be spread? The, well, you Christians. Know, just leave Christ, them? The, the, there's a panorama of Christian thought. There's right. a spectrum of Christian thought on this. So there there are some Christians that are absolute pacifists, and they have had a moral conviction to absolute pacifism. Because it's all in contrast. Okay. The Eastern Orthodox Church says that just war is can be actionable, but it's always a sin. Okay. So the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox position is that wars can be just but they're always sin even when they are just okay yeah and so if you kill because you're fighting in a war you then have to do penance and you have to, uh, have to repent. let me just finish this brother's point of it the roman catholic tradition has an understanding of just war which is different from the orthodox position which is that in certain circumstances a just war can be a morally good thing so it's not a sin to fight in a, a morally just war so there's a panorama of Christian perspectives, okay? And I follow, I, I fall into more the Roman tradition, which is that in certain circumstances, war isn't just just, it's morally obligatory, right? And ISIS is an example where war is just and morally obligatory. To make, to make them all Christians? No, 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 no. To stop them carrying out a, a greater injustice. But, they, but you would still change the belief system, right? No, 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 no. No, I wouldn't. No, you can never force someone to become a Christian. Right, because that's, that was my question, more or less. Was, um, no, establishing, it no, establishing the kingdom of God is not always... It, it's, it's about an individual's relationship, a communal relationship, but it's also about establishing those best predicates within society that make make it easiest for people to become Christian. Now, that you, you've got to understand, Christians can't force people to become Christians. That goes against both church experience, where we've tried that in the past, and it also goes against the fact of our own moral disposition and teaching. People have to come to faith as their own means, but what we can do is we can remove those barriers that stop them coming to faith. 
Okay. Yeah. What, what would those be? Because there I are mean, many. You could make an argument of like yeah. scientific education and evolution is pushing people away from belief in Jesus. I, I actually think that scientific education. I, I think that atheistic in teachings of evolution is pushing people. So I would teach evolution from a theistic position. In terms of maybe you don't want to get into that. But no, like yeah, yeah, we're not going to get into that right now because we're already off our original topic. The, the the point that I'm making is that, for example, you know, we allow gambling. Um, outlets to set themselves up in our, in our poorest communities. We allow um, betting shops and alcohol uh, dispensaries yeah, yeah, yeah. to be set up amongst the poorest of our communities. This is a barrier to the Kingdom of God. We need to get rid of those things. We need to remove them. We allow things such as, um, in, in terms of in, atheistic evolution in schools, in schools. No, there's a difference. There is a difference. What is the kingdom of God? Right. But what is the kingdom? That is exactly what we've just been speaking about. Could you give me it in a nutshell? Uh, uh, it's <laughs> about the rule of God in people's hearts. Could you give it from the scripture? Yes. Well, you know the verse. The kingdom of God is not the way I read no drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Absolutely. Otherwise, my servants would fight. I got the impression that you said there's legitimacy in the spread of the kingdom of God through physical violence. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's you, 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 I'm well. going to try to. Yeah. I'm going to try to say this as clearly as I possibly can. Okay. If there are circumstances of such an extreme nature such as ISIS, which is a very modern example. This is not a mythical example. You don't have to do a thought experiment, yeah? That, that seeks to dominate the world and impose a system of laws that are contrary to the kingdom of God in that situation. Another example that perhaps people of a certain generation are, are more uh, emotionally connected to is the idea of fighting Nazism, yeah? There are just some things in this world that are so evil that to not to not hold on hold on to not fight them to not fight them is morally evil. And, and, and this is who cares about nationalism? I'm not interested in nationalism. You're not listening to me. You're talking about national morality, which is accepted over the world. I'm not interested there in nationalism. A, there is such a thing I'm as not a interested just, in national but morality. Not a biblical concept. No, any, I'm sorry. Any that is not true. Under any sort. That is not Jesus, true. Jesus, Read the Old Testament. Jesus, God had no problem with war. We're in the new covenant, brother. Uh, yes, and what happens, yes. In what, happens, yes. in what happens in Revelations? What happens in Revelations? Does Christ come back as a conqueror? Like Thank you. No, yes. No, 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 yes, he does. Let me, no, no, let me ask yes, I remember that revelation. Yeah. Yeah. What happens in Revelations? What happens? Well, you want to go into the whole book?